Hello, uh, welcome to our webinar on how to get the most out of online conferences. Uh, my name is Simon Clark. I am the EGU's Committee Programs Coordinator. Um, today's webinar structure will focus on uh, our three speakers initially. And once uh, all speakers have finished, uh, we'll start with a Q&A session. If you have a question, uh, please enter it by clicking on the Q&A tab uh, at the bottom of the screen. Um, there you can also upvote questions. Um, so questions with more votes, I'll have a more bias to asking when it comes to uh, moderating the questions. Um, although we will try to get through all the questions asked in this session. Um, this webinar is also recorded and be uploaded to our YouTube channel, uh, European Geosciences Union. So first, I'll just introduce our speakers today. We have uh, Peter van der Beek, uh, who is the uh, EGU Programme Committee Chair. We have uh, Martin Rasmussen, who is a Managing Director of Copernicus and the BEGU 21 Meeting Organiser. And then we have uh, Anouk Binyest, who is the EGU's Union Level Early Career Scientist Representative. So to start off with, we'll be uh, Peter be speaking. So if you'd uh, like to begin, Peter. Okay, uh, thank you, Simon. And I'll just share my screen. Okay, so uh, welcome and good afternoon, everybody. As Simon said, my name is Peter van der Beek and I am since a bit less than a year, the EGU Program Committee Chair. And so what I'm going to say about virtual conferences is obviously going to be very strongly colored by uh, what we are doing for VEGU 21, our General Assembly this year that will run over the last two years of April. And I will make just some comments on what our guiding vision for virtual conferences is now and in the future. I will talk about the value of virtual conferences, but also the challenges that they pose. And while doing that, I will focus in particular on uh, issues of accessibility, inclusiveness, and uh, sustainability. So first of all, our, our guiding vision, and I think uh, an important thing really is that virtual conferences haven't started with the pandemic and they won't stop with the pandemic. Uh, the current pandemic has only accelerated a movement that had already started. Um, we ha had been thinking like many other organizations about virtual or hybrid conferences, uh, mostly obviously be it from a uh, sustainability uh, viewpoint. Uh, and obviously the thing that happened last year was that this went from a hypothesis of how would virtual conferences or hybrid conferences look like in the future to uh, what do we do in six weeks time? Are we going to cancel the General Assembly or are we going to bring it online? So there has been a clear acceleration of that movement, but uh, it's my uh, clear view that virtual conferences are here to stay they're not going to go away and that means that in the going into the future we will need to find the balance between in-person conferences virtual conferences and hybrid conferences there will be situations when an in-person conference is the best solution there'll be situations where a virtual conference is what we want to do and this is really i think one of the challenge that we we have to work on and find out what's uh organization is, is the most suitable for what circumstances. And the reason for that is that virtual conference clearly have advantages. They go quite a way in solving problems of accessibility, inclusiveness, and sustainability, but they also pose other challenges in these and other fields. So uh, for the rest of this contribution, I'd just like to walk through some of these uh, values and, and challenges of virtual conferences. So values well the first one we've seen i guess in the uh, in the last year during the pandemic these have really been the platforms for scientific exchange and networking and the continuity of scientific communication many organizations uh, have decided to uh, cancel their meetings in over the last year others have decided to bring them online uh, we at EGU decided last year to bring the General Assembly online on very short notice and ran um, sharing geoscience online. And I think the response to that has been overwhelmingly positive and it was important for the community that 
uh, this sharing uh, and scientific communication continued even during very challenging and, and difficult times. More in general, however, and looking again forward into the future, what we've seen is that uh, these virtual conferences are uh, more accessible. And this is, for instance, for students, PhD candidates, early career researchers, researchers from low and middle income countries, because of, in general, lower registration fees, absence of travel costs, and in particular, when targeted fee waivers are in place. We've seen this last year, again, during Sharing Geoscience Online, which was totally free, and we had the highest participant number ever in the General Assembly. This year, we've put in place uh, targeted fee waivers for uh, undergraduate and master students, for researchers from lower and lower middle income countries, and for PhD candidates from all middle uh, income countries, uh, again, to foster that accessibility. Virtual conferences are innovative. We can experiment different ways to communicate science and move away from the traditional oral poster format. Uh, last year, uh, we ran all the uh, scientific sessions as uh, chat sessions. This year, and I'm sure Martin will talk about that in more detail, we will run them as virtual PICO sessions. Um, and this allows us to just yeah, try different things and uh, experiment with communicating science differently. And that also, uh, that single presentation type that we've been running last year and that we will run this year means that uh, the meetings, the uh, conferences are more equal uh, and therefore more inclusive. And the uh, other uh, thing that we noticed clearly last year with the chat scientific discussions, there was a much lower threshold to participate in the scientific discussion and the scientific discussion became much more diverse and we had many more people, uh, in particular also early career scientists, uh, uh, joining in the scientific uh, discussion and discourse. There were clear advantages in accessibility uh, for people, for instance, with motion and hearing impairments. Uh, science, uh, virtual conferences can be more tuned to uh, neurodiverse people um, under certain conditions. And, and this is something we need to work on, is to find how to make them uh, uh, as accessible as, as possible. And finally, obviously, uh, virtual conferences are more sustainable by avoiding uh, carbon emissions resulting from travel, in particular into continental travel and on-site activities, uh, such as running the conference center, hotels, restaurants, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, of course, we have to offset that against the, uh, the carbon costs of uh, um, live streaming and bandwidth, et cetera. But overall, the, uh, the budget is clearly uh, very positive for virtual conferences. So, what are the challenges? There's some here. Uh, first of all, I think there's a real challenge with engagement. It's much harder to fully engage in a conference while you're sitting at home, especially in a pandemic lockdown setting. When you're away on an in-person conference, you're away, you're there, you can spend uh, really your whole day there and continue networking uh, in the evenings and over uh, meals in a restaurant, etc. And if you know, you're sitting at home and you have to uh, do your household, make your own meals, maybe take care of your children who cannot go to school, etc., etc., it obviously becomes very much harder to, to engage in the conference. A problem that um, we've run into and which was actually uh, much, much harder to solve than, than everybody thought, I think, is that of time zones. Again, in an in-person conference, people go there, they deal with their jet lag, uh, and there's a single time on which the conference runs. This is obviously a much bigger problem in, in virtual conferences, and I don't think anybody has found a fully satisfactory a solution to that problem yet. We've seen different organizations experiment with uh, different uh, planning and different scheduling. We've seen AGU trying to run a, a global scheduling of their meeting. Uh, we will not do that. We will keep uh, VEGU 21 on European times. We've uh, tried to 
develop tools to help us with our scheduling, to make the scheduling as friendly as possible to people in different time zones. Uh, but, but again, this is, a, this is a real challenge and something we're looking uh, uh, into how, how to solve best. These two issues lead, I think, to fatigue. <laughs> Oh. Zoom fatigue is the is the buzzword at the moment, but I think there is definitely something like virtual conference fatigue too. We see this in declining participation numbers in virtual conferences, and we've clearly seen this uh, over over the last year. And that is also linked to the fact that networking is much less organic and much less uh, simple to organize than at in-person conferences. This needs a a concerted organization effort from uh, the conference organizers. Uh, and that is also linked to the, to the issue of serendipity. There is just so many less possibilities for chance encounters. So we have to create these possibilities. And finally, while uh, I said as a value of virtual conferences that they, are, they can be more accessible, there are also clearly accessibility issues for people with visual and hearing impairments. Um, they're very strongly visual uh, uh, virtual conferences. And so if you have a visual impairment, that's, uh, that, that can be a real challenge to deal with. And this means that these challenges require innovative conference designs uh, guided by the need of participants. And I think that Martin will go into that uh, in more detail. So I might just leave it here and uh, we can move to the next speaker. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, if you have questions for Peter, please drop them in the Q&A and we'll get to them after all the speakers have finished. Uh, up next, we have Martin, who will be speaking from a more design perspective. So Martin, if you'd like to begin. Thank you very much, Simon, and welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining this webinar. Um, and please make use of question answers because uh, you can already or you can e still be part of the organizational process, Peter and I are here. So if you have good suggestions, we can still maybe incorporate them. I will now also share my screen. I have prepared some um, slides for you. Okay. Um, something has happened here. Okay, yeah. Um, so my perspective as a conference organizer is more from a design perspective. And uh, also here, what were our, our challenges and what are our solutions? Um, and um, what will also stay after the pandemic and also in hybrid conferences. So um, I, I take uh, the opportunity of using also where, where Peter ended, namely with the EDI from the design perspective, namely when we talk about equality and Peter already mentioned that um, we did it last year and this year in a way that all presenters get the ch same chances to get, go there more a bit, a bit more into detail. Um, the good thing is, um, that in this VPICO format, which is applied to really almost all sessions, yeah, especially the scientific sessions, all scientific sessions run VPICO. The good thing is that it's not a it's not a distribution between those who can show their face, get some uh, dedicated time, whereas the others have to share uh, the rest of the time with their poster. But here, everybody gets the same chances, and this is mainly a two minute pitch. And we often got the question, okay, why is it only two minutes? I was used to uh, give my 15 minutes presentation in the past. Yeah, but the idea is here totally different. It's not to give a full presentation. It's only to give a pitch. And to be honest, every scientist should be able to summarize the essence of their work within two minutes. And that's that's great because in principle, it's from a student and to a Nobel laureate, all, everybody gets just a two minute pitch. But um, then we have these 90 minute time blocks. And in these 90 minute time blocks, we have, um, we strive to have up to 20 uh, VPCOs. Of course, sometimes it's one, two less, but uh, in general, it's 20 PICOs. And then after these 40 minutes of uh, two minute presentations, we have another 50 minutes inside the time block for discussion. And we even leave the discussion chats, the breakout chats on for another 30 minutes, which gives us literally 80 minutes of discussion time per time block for 20 picos. Um, this is actually more discussion time because in Vienna, when you join an oral session, let's not talk about posters because there you do not have dedicated time at all. It is a general networking, which is sometimes great, but there's no dedicated time. 
for for um, for an oral session, you have three minutes normally. We say, okay, you have fifteen minutes, which is twelve minutes uh, presentation, three minutes discussion. Um, but that's for a single presentation. And even if you are not too much interested in this specific presentation, you have to wait for the next presentation. And if this is super interesting to you, you only have three minutes to discuss with that uh, presenter. Here, um, we have in principle, just from the math, four minutes per single VPico. We have 80 minutes for 20 picos. But you could also say, well, but if I'm in, in particular interested in a special VPico, I have in principle 50 minutes. I can talk to an, to, a, to an author. So we really encourage everybody to take this opportunity to not wait for others to give you a slot for the discussion, but to grab the discussion yourself, to simply say, I'm interested in that particular presentation. I go find the uh, author, the pitch was excellent, and we have text-based breakout chats per abstract where you can uh, meet the particular author and ask your particular questions. So much more time, actually, great chance for discussion. Diversity and tear down some barriers. Peter already mentioned that we really made the experience, and that was very good feedback last year from early career scientists, so um, diversity in career stages, but also gender diversity, and also in terms of the level of English knowledge, that these text-based chats and doing a lot of things text-based actually helps a lot. Um, it lowers the burden to ask questions. And great thing is you have written out text. This can be read by software. You can scrolling back in time because you, in a text chat, you can scroll back and, and, and uh, watch again the question or the discussion of five minutes ago. And uh, regarding inclusiveness, P Peter already mentioned also that we have this waiver program and we also have no, no traveling and we enlarge the target group. Um, but it's also great because our two months period of display time where we say, okay, the conference is the one thing. If you are scheduled for Monday afternoon during the conference and you have your two minutes pitch, that's already great because you raise awareness and you meet then the people in during this 50 minutes of discussion time in your breakout chat. But you can take this much, much further. We have two full months where you can upload display material, people can watch it, can be any, any kind, from a video to a power presentation or anything. And people can watch it, people can discuss with you, yet they can comment on it. And people can already start reusing it and working with it and also helping you maybe even to, uh, to improve it, yeah? uh, the design. So this is, this is really uh, something I think in, in, in under these headlines, uh, there's a lot of positive effects of such a virtual conference. Also regarding open your science. I mean, this is one of the key issues in nowadays, open your science. And the display materials in the past, we have uh, provided this since 2009, the possibility to upload display materials. This was used by almost 10% of the presenters. In principle, every year the same. There was no real motivation to upload anything until 2019. In 2020, we haven't received from all 18,000 18, abstracts present, uh, display materials, but more than 60%. And in 2021, actually, since this is now really the, the essence of the, of the whole conference and so on, we really expect much more content. Um, maybe not 100%, but we hope that, uh, that authors really take the opportunity. And uh, we have seen that most often this content is CC BY. Um, of course, we allow that people say, no, no, I cannot go CC BY with my data set or so. I must keep it um, uh, as a normal author copyright with uh, um, all the rights reserved. And then it will, it will only be visible to, conferences, uh, to conference attendees. But if you make it CC BY, it will not only be uh, available for conference uh, attendees during two months. Afterwards, it will go on to EGSphere and everybody can, can see it. And actually, the display material is available 24-7. Uh, and um, that is also great, especially if you come from a time zone where it's not possible for you to follow EGU21 or any other virtual conference for the entire uh, full week or so. Also, we started last year with commenting options, and this will be um, not only be provided this year, we will also encourage people to make more use of this, that you really say, okay, great, even, even uh, weeks before the actual conference start, I have my display material on, I, I enable commenting, and then I get feedback from the community, from my colleagues. I can answer to this. I have a discussion. Maybe I will even uh, I will even improve my display material. And this is all input for your presentation. Actually, then you have during EG21 your pitch, and there you can actually already um, uh, uh, bring in all these new uh, insights you got from the commenting. 
So this is really an opportunity, I think, for open science. And in principle, to be honest, um, in the past, everybody always said, I would like to have an oral, I would like to have an oral. Well, everybody can have an oral now. Yeah, because you simply record your oral, you simply rep uh, record your talk, and you upload this as display material, and then you really have the stage you want to have, and you can can really use rich media content, um, because often complex scientific um, problems or methods are very difficult to explain if you only have a PowerPoint, but here you can use rich media content, I and I think this is uh, in particular a great thing. Of course, all these things are technical achievements of the past years or of the 21st century, which is not in particular something for virtual conferences. This is of course also for in-person meetings or hybrid meetings, but the great thing was that the necessity that people had to go along these lines uh, to make a virtual conference possible raised the opportunities and this is a learning curve for all of us and maybe people get used to it and then they take this further this experience further to the to the future where we have in-person meetings again or hybrid meetings whatever um, so i think that this was a great uh, motivation also regarding networking one might say well if we do not have in-person contact that's very difficult for networking except for the networking i do through social media and so on anyway but especially at the conference and i say well um, if we all do it right then it can be even more networking actually um, because the virtual networking is unlimited in time and space in in vienna you must meet somebody to be able to talk to them here what we do at EGU21 is we have networker tools where you can connect to other attendees. And once you're connected, it's in principle independent where you are or they are inside this virtual space. It doesn't matter whether you are in the entrance hall and somebody else is in the poster hall, which is a five minute walk away. It's all virtual. You can, you can directly see where they are. You can see that they are online and you can start spontaneous text chats. That's, for example, a possibility you have never had in Vienna. In Vienna, you run around the building to find somebody or you must know that somebody is in a particular session. Also spontaneous uh, contacts, of course, with people you don't know yet are possible because once you're in a session, we will show you all, uh, all um, attendees of this session, even if you're not connected to them, because actually it's like showing your face in, in Vienna in a room. And then you can connect to new people and extend, uh, extend your network. You can also suggest if you know two people and you might think that they uh, have something in common, you can connect them to each other. You can suggest this and then they can connect. Um, so, and of course, you also have the great chance to take this further. You find your peer group, maybe through our networking tools, but then you arrange something outside. You say, oh, well, we are all the people who are interested in catchment modeling and hydrology. Let's meet outside. Let's meet in the other town or I set up something or next week and so on. Yeah. So this is also something, of course, it's also possible in the in-person meeting. But I personally think in an in-person meeting, you are very focused on this one, one week. Whereas here, I think you have great chances to take this much further. Our networking tools, for example, simply stay online. The network you build during EGU21 stops not after EGU21. It's an embedded uh, networking tool you can use at any other EGU conference in any other EGU journal. The people you, you met in the Virtual Congress Center of EGU21, you will see later on ACP or BG or any other journal, and then you can still network with them. And for us as organizers, this was also a very great opportunity to tailor solutions. For in-person meetings, we have some organizational limits, but also architectural limits. We have the rooms we have, we have the spaces we have. We can, of course, design them in a specific way, but more or less they are given. For virtual conferences, we can apply in principle any tool people want. And this is a great chance to realize actually your ideas in the best possible way. So you see, there are lots of great opportunities, of course, also some, uh, some, some threats or some things uh, you have to keep in mind, but I'm, I'm, very, I'm very much looking forward actually to this conference, gather online in April, and I hope that we will see many of you. Thank you very much uh, for your attention and I'm happy to get your questions. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Martin, for that insight. Um, before we get round to answering questions, uh, we have our final speaker in uh, Anouk, if you'd like to begin, please. Yeah, cool. Um, hi, everyone. I'm going to share my screen as well. Um, oh, one second. This one. All right. Um, 
Yeah, so I'm going to talk more about um, like personal experience and how you as a participant can get the most out of a virtual conference. Um, and I'm also hoping to convince you that attending a virtual conference is, um, yeah, is really good for your um, career, for your CV, for your science, for your mental health. Um, so the first, we, like first, I would like to talk about why you should um, attend a conference and whether this is a physical one or a, a virtual one. I think in general, a conference is um, is very good to attend because you have the chance to showcase your science. Uh, you can show the community what you've been doing, and I think uh, it's a very efficient way of getting it out to a bigger audience. Then second, um, and I hope you agree with me, um, science is a group effort. Uh, we're in this together, and that means that we have to talk to our peers, um, to uh, our collaborators at different institutes. And at a conference, it's a very um, easy way to get uh, all these people together um, and make our science happen. And then lastly, for future projects, it's always good to work with multiple people and you will, um, you will need to find collaborators. And also there, a conference um, can be a really good uh, starting point. However, um, a conference uh, is not without risks. Um, there are a couple of traps, uh, some of them um, you might be familiar with. Uh, the one I find always most challenging is how to deal with um, like this, the big programs that conferences often um, offer. There's so many things to choose from. Um, how do you choose the right thing? Um, I will get to that um, in a second. Another trap um, which, is, which I think you should be aware of is that, uh, well, you want to network, you want to find your peers and they are somewhere, but how do you find them? Well, as Martin mentioned already, during a physical conference, you might run into them. Um, at a virtual conference, this is um, somehow less likely. You know where they are, probably at home uh, or maybe in the office. But how do you contact them? It's very easy to just sit back and absorb information. But if you want to meet people, you actually have to get active. Um, so this can be a challenge. And then lastly, uh, both physical and virtual conferences can be very overwhelming. They can be tiring. Um, and I think especially virtual conferences, looking at a screen, um, being focused all the time is, um, is quite tiring. So I'll talk a little bit about how you can stay um, active and relaxed during a virtual conference. Um, so let's start with this first challenge. How do you make your, like the program that fits best with your interests? What helps for me personally is um, like a week uh, before the conference or a little bit longer before, I browse through all the sessions, all the events that I find interesting. I tick the boxes. I make my personal program, um, which means that I know already uh, before the before the conference what sessions I would like to attend. Does, this doesn't mean that I'll, I will attend all sessions, uh, but does mean that at any given point in time during the conference, I know which three, four, five events are ha happening. And so it will make it easier for me to choose uh, what I will do depending on my mood, depending on what I want to see. Second, uh, what I prepare before I attend a virtual conference or a conference in general, um, is that I try to find out who will be there, like whom of my peers, whom of my potential collaborators um, are around, where can I find them? Um, at a virtual conference, this means that I can look in the program already when they will have their, um, their sessions, um, their, their talks, um, I list them um, and I try to attend. So I have an easy, well, opening phrase if I actually run into them virtually. Because I think getting connected to your uh, peers is very important. Um, and so to be prepared for that, the one thing I recommend everybody to do is to make a virtual business card. Um, this can be anything basically from uh, maybe your, um, your profile on the Institute website, maybe you have your own web page, um, it could be a LinkedIn page, um, anything really that kind of gets your contact details together, your research interest, um, your vision maybe, um, and make sure that it's easy to share, that if you run into somebody, you can just provide a link and people have uh, all the information about you that they want, that you want them to have. Now, once you have a virtual business card, uh, you can start getting connected to people. Um, this doesn't necessarily have to be in like talking already, but you can start following people on Twitter, maybe on uh, LinkedIn uh, or Facebook. Um, or you can choose uh, a more old fashioned way, like sending an email. I think around conference, like around a conference, people are more susceptible to uh, receiving emails, to answering them. And so I would just say like, 
be bold, send out an email to a potential collaborator or a peer you want to get in contact with. Um, and I am like, I'm quite confident you'll, you will receive an email, uh, an email back. And then lastly, one thing I can recommend during the conference is that you make sure that you are sitting behind your computer in a comfortable way, um, like comfortable enough to turn on your camera and start talking to people. This doesn't mean that you have to wear your best outfit, but it does mean that you are okay with turning on the camera and speaking to people because uh, for people to network and to remember your name, it's always good to have the face name connection. Um, if you can't turn on your camera, maybe put a little uh, picture of yourself. It will make it easier for people to remember you when you uh, meet them in the future at a physical conference. Um, because why I think it's important to network is not only to uh, find collaborators or to make your science happen. It's also because when you talk to people, um, you brainstorm, you, go, you think out of the box, you may get new ideas for future um, science projects. Um, or perhaps you've been working for months on a specific issue and you can't figure it out. If you talk to people, you might find the missing pieces to make your uh, project work. Um, well, all these new impressions, um, all the information you receive might um, like be a bit overwhelming. So the one thing we already talked about a bit also in the previous um, talk by Martin is that you can get a so-called conference burnout. So this means that you won't absorb any information anymore and it will just drain you completely. So the one thing I can um, recommend really is to take breaks. And by taking breaks, I mean literally leave your desk, get away from your computer. It's okay to not, um, to not follow a session. Um, I would recommend you to, I don't know, uh, spend some time with the people you're at home with, your family maybe, flatmates, have a coffee with, you, coffee with your neighbor. Or if you prefer to be alone and not talk to anybody, maybe you want to read a book or get active. The key really is to like do something different to keep your mind flexible uh, so you can last uh, in case of the EGU, uh, the whole two week uh, that the conference lasts. Um, I gathered a little bit of, um, of, of literature, of um, blog posts, of uh, YouTube videos that uh, help you with, uh, if, well, if you read them, you can, um, it gives you information about how you can plan your program, how you can network and find people online, and also how to stay like mentally and physically healthy during a conference. Um, I'm, I think maybe the, share, the slides will be shared. Uh, otherwise, you can send me an email and I can forward um, this to you. So I hope that um, with this talk uh, added to the previous two talks, we've um, convinced you that joining a virtual conference is really a must, not only uh, for your science, um, scientific part of your career, um, but also because it's kind of fun. Uh, especially virtually, it's very easy to interact with people all over the world, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, it takes away lots of uh, accessibility boundaries. Um, I'm pretty sure that you will start new uh, collaborations or maybe continue older ones. Uh, you might get new ideas. And most of all, um, we all hope that you have fun uh, during this virtual conference. Um, so the talk I gave was based on my own experiences. Uh, we are very interested in what your experience are uh, in a virtual conference, either prior or after uh, the General Assembly. Um, and if you've never attended a virtual um, conference, we would be very, well, yeah, we would be very interested about your expectations. Like, what do you expect from a virtual conference? Thanks. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Anik. So we're moving on to the uh, Q&A stage of the um, webinar now. Um, so perhaps think on the next point of what are your expectations for the conference. Um, but before we get around to that, I'll start working through some of the questions asked in the chat and the further questions I've been given beforehand. Um, and the first question, I think this is uh, perhaps directed more to Martin, and I think this is more regards to perhaps the breakout rooms, the text chats, is um, why are we having a, why, what's the benefits of perhaps having a text chat instead of a oral or visual interaction? Yeah, thanks. Um, this is absolutely a key question because we're often asked. Um, we thought actually about the possibility of having uh, also the breakout, tech, uh, breakout chats, video chats between um, the authors of the abstracts and those who are interested in their presentations. 
Um, it, this is definitely um, um, a logistical or infrastructural issue because you uh, have to take into account that we have uh, 40 parallel VPICO sessions, um, 20 each. So that makes it 800 uh, video chats which are running in parallel at the same time. Um, and where you, of course, have to, you do not have an equal distribution. You have some which have uh, very good or very, very prominent, and then they have a very good attendance. Others might not have so much. But of course, you always have to have the maximum in, in, uh, in, in mind. And that's, that was the reason why we were against this, actually, because making, for example, Zoom breakout rooms is uh, navigating completely away from our conference platform and has some limitations going into the big blue button which we use for the presenters of vpico um it's not um it's it's difficult to maintain 800 900 in parallel so that was the reason why we went to text chats because there we already got the good experience from last year and as peter mentioned and i also mentioned in my presentation the text chats um we, we are a bit afraid that going in all formats we we offer a lot of video chats but in all formats, back to video chats, then you have again this, this effect that it might be even more difficult for people to ask questions than in a Zoom meet, uh, in like, like in a Zoom meeting, than in an oral room in Vienna, um, because it's it's double burden. It's one thing is that um, that you show yourself, and and the other thing is that uh, it's also difficult to keep track of questions in an open meeting, actually, as we all might have experienced over the past year. In the text chat, however, we've noticed last year that we had contributions from people who have never asked a question before in an oral room. Excellent. Uh, thanks for that response. Um, so I have another question. I think this may be more for Peter. Um, of course, I know let's jump in if you wish. And this was more about uh, how has the coronavirus um, shaped or influenced how conferences will be organized going forward, um, including after the pandemic? Okay, well, yeah, I touched a little bit upon this. So uh, what the pandemic did is accelerate tremendously our thinking about this. I, I think uh, it, it didn't start with the pandemic. It was clear that we had to go to some sort of either hybrid conference or some combination of in-person and, and virtual conference. And this is mainly for a, from again, from a sustainability viewpoint. What the pandemic has done, it, it has forced us to experiment. And I think Martin also touched upon this. Uh, we had to come up with solutions, sometimes at very short notice. This year, we had a little bit longer to, wor uh, to work on it and to think about it, but it's still going very quickly. And so I think we're in a phase now where, where we are experimenting, where we are putting tools in place. And, and some of these uh, are clearly going to, to stay on. And uh, I don't think we're going to go back to a traditional in-person only meeting. Meetings will be hybrid in the future. Uh, we will keep, for instance, the uh, presentation, the display uploads. That's pretty clear. Uh, there will be the link to EGU sphere. There will be the commenting. Uh, and so there's a lot of things that have also sort of come together because EGU sphere was something that was developed in parallel. And all of a sudden it became extremely useful because we could put it together with uh, the virtual conference. So I think going beyond the pandemic, going forward in the future, I see a hybrid concept with many of the things and of the tools that we're developing now for this virtual conference going forward into the hybrid conferences. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, so next I have a couple of questions regarding the PICOs. Perhaps this is more a, a general question. Um, um, and it's, I suppose there's two questions regarding them. One is, uh, will there be uh, tutorials on what a PICO presentation could look like, what uh, the audience can expect? Um, and secondly, will presenters be able to see the audience uh, when giving a PICO presentation? Maybe I can just quickly answer the first one and then leave the second one again to, to Martin. Uh, yes, there will be tutorials. We're making them right now, actually. And so like last year, we'll be bringing out a series of tutorials for presenters, for conveners, etc., to help you navigate the platform and to help you 
set up the session and and prepare your presentation in the in the best possible way Yeah, okay, then I take the second one. Um, so um, indeed, um, as a speaker, you will not see the audience. Um, the, the way VPico works is as follows. And there's a big blue button live session. We choose big blue button. This has pros and cons, definitely. But um, the good thing is that it's uh, open source in a way that we could fully integrate it in our platform um, with all permissions also for chairpersons, uh, speakers, presenters, and so on. Um, that means that in the big blue button live video chat, um, the chairpersons, conveners, speakers, authors, and the conference assistant will meet. They will see each other, they talk to each other, they can chat with each other, and they present. And um, both the, um, the video from the speaker and the speaker who's uh, at that moment speaking and the whiteboard, as it's called in big blue button, so the slides uh, they present, this will be streamed. And when you, when you enter the live session from the program, on that live session page, you see the stream from this big blue button as a no normal attendee. Um, and you have a text chat so that you can already discuss some things, maybe clarify some issues and so on. Um, that means that um, everybody can see the speakers, but the speakers can see only themselves. Um, which, yeah, and, and in the end, after the live presentations are gone, and we distribute in these breakout text chats per abstract, we open this big blue button video chat for everybody. That means the main focus after the live presentations is to meet the authors of interest in their breakout text chats for the scientific part. But in parallel, you will also have the chance in, a, in another browser tab to enter, if you want to, uh, this video chat where you then can meet everybody who's present in that um, session. Excellent. Thanks um, for the answer. Um, so we have an, another question, which again, I think this might be more for you, Martin. Um, and it's regarding uh, the Creative Commons, uh, the, sorry, the Creative Commons licensing. And it's Will there be an option to choose whether you have your display material on a Creative Commons license or not when uploading the material? Um, they relate this to unpublished material. And I think this is perhaps relating to whether they can prevent people from downloading or keeping material they don't want to be shared. Yeah, very important question, especially for early career scientists. Um, so the point is the following. When you upload your display materials, different from last year, where the uh, display material was open for everybody, this year, in this two months period, from 31st of March to 31st of May, display material is only visible to people who have paid or get a waiver, so are registered for the conference. So it's, it's still hopefully 15,000 people or so, but at least it is, it is a specific uh, a group of people and you must have have a login so you cannot easily uh, um, uh, set up a, a bot who is, who is uh, downloading all this stuff then when you upload your display material you can decide whether you make it cc by or you it, it stays with your um, all rights reserved um, which is then also indicated to the people so that is also a good thing so that you can you have full control you can also exchange something if you for example I don't know, after, after a while you become afraid or you want to enrich your content, you can have another version and so on. At the end, after, after the 31st of May, when, when this two month period is over, um, what we do is that the CC BY content now is transferred to Egosphere and then it becomes available for everybody. That has nothing to do anymore literally with the conference. However, the, um, the content which is not CC BY, this will stay inside the conference even there, you can delete it. You, you have the chance to go end of May into your tool and say, okay, I, I, was, I withdraw my display material. Mm -hmm. But you can even keep it there because this is only accessible to people who registered. Even in the future, they, it must be people who registered for EGU21. Um, so therefore, it, it, there's a different flavors and you can decide on your own how much, how much you want to open your signs. Excellent. Uh, thanks for that answer. Um, so we have a few more questions. Uh, I think this one's perhaps more for Anouk. Um, and they're asking, what's an example of a good virtual business card and how should you best use it? 
Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, that's a really good question. Um, so in terms of, um, of visuals, the business card could be anything. It could be your website, could be your institute page, could be LinkedIn profile. I think uh, what needs to be on it is your name and contact details and preferably how else you can be contacted except email. Like if you're active on Twitter, put your Twitter account. If you have an Instagram account, put your Instagram account. Um, I think the advantage of a virtual business card is that you can put more information of yourself um, out there. Um, and how you can use it, uh, well, you can put, for example, a QR code on your presentation uh, or a link, very easy for people to click on. And then they get, for example, the last five publications that you did, including your contact details. Um, or when you're chatting to somebody, you accidentally run into somebody virtually, you can really quickly share your link and then people can directly go to your page and read more about you. Um, so, I, so I think the virtual business card is much more fluid and more flexible than a paper card, which just has your name and uh, address on it. Yeah, I, I hope this answers a bit the question. Yeah, thank you, Luke. And I think the second question uh, is perhaps something you can also speak to, but also I think everyone else could as well, is um, what advice do you have for people who are perhaps organizing their first online uh, session, perhaps it's a workshop or, or webinar? I can, I can say something um, maybe a bit more motivational. Uh, like I think, first of all, that it's awesome that you're organizing this and that whatever you try to do, it will be great uh, because you're not alone. You have a team of people working with you. So I recommend to, um, to talk with your team and just make a nice program that you would like to receive and uh, like, don't worry about it and just like, go for it. Excellent. Um, yeah, so moving on from that question, um, I think we have another question for Martin, and it's more about, uh, can we record uh, rich media such as uh, video and slides or a code, etc., and uh, use it as display material? Yes, please do so. Um, so the idea is that for the display material, it can be a PDF file, it can be a PowerPoint file, it can be a slide, a JPEG, something like this, it can be an HTML page, but it can be a video. What we do with the videos is, by the way, you can, if you have already your, your video on your own platform, YouTube or somewhere else, you can also uh, drop, the, drop the link and we link to your presentation. If it's on YouTube, we will even grab your video avatar and show it uh, with your abstract. Um, but if you upload a video file, an MP4 file, what we will do is that we will, we have an, a Vimeo channel and the Vimeo channel is closed in a way um, that a request to the Vimeo channel for download must come from our server through our conference program. That means that when you upload an MP4 file to our presentation upload tool, uh, we transfer this to Vimeo. It will be archived in the EGU21 Vimeo channel and we link it uh, in, inside our program, which means that we also grab the video avatar from Vimeo, show this on your abstract page um, so that people then can um, watch your video and um, have good streaming uh, quality. Because last year what we did was we had videos already and we put on Google Cloud um, and of course servers inside EU. Um, and uh, then people watched from there, but this was of course not a full streaming service. That's the reason why we use Vimeo. And we are happy to get your videos, by the way, because that's a great opportunity, especially for early career scientists. Excellent. Thank you for that, Martin. Um, the question regarding networking opportunities is, uh, there's some um, advice saying that perhaps we should be using uh, spatial video chats, um, such as wonder.com. Um, which is currently free to use. Yeah, does anyone want to speak to the networking opportunities uh, we will be providing? Yeah, I can say something and then the others can of course add something. So um, uh, thanks for the, for the, uh, for the tip. Uh, WonderMe, we also looked into. The problem with WonderMe is at the moment, since it is um, in a relatively early stage and you do not yet have a, a pricing scheme, 
um, in place, um, it is a bit difficult for us as an official mean of networking. We are absolutely happy that individuals will organize what we call pop-up networking events. This will be possible from the 31st of March. They can always simply add a, enter a form. They give us a time, they give us a title, and they give us a target. And then we show it in the program and others can join. And this can be any platform. We are absolutely happy that people link uh, WonderMe, GatherTown, and so on. But when we talk about the selection of platforms for the official channels, we, of course, must ensure that it's a relatively stable tool, that we have good support um, from, the, from the vendor and so on. We haven't seen this really for WonderMe yet. We looked into GatherTown. However, there, for example, it was an issue, the same for Braindate and so on, is that we really talk about 15,000 people. And then we do not talk anymore about free or something. And we also do not talk about, um, well, it's for science, so it's educational. Yeah, but that's not what the salespeople think about our conference. They see it as a commercial enterprise. Um, so therefore, it, it, it would have been rather cost intensive thing. And what we tried this year to deliver best service to a good price, because we said that this limit of it should not be cost more than 150 euro on average. Um, and that's the reason why before example, do not have for everybody for 15,000 people gather town license and so on. However, what what EGU is providing is that there are gather town licenses and they will be used by networking events from the divisions. And Simon, Simon, maybe will anyway talk more about this. And um, so um, we we make away, um, make use of this, but we cannot do this, for example, for VPGO, as I said, we, where we have eight hundred in parallel. Yeah, um, I think I can speak to that, given I'm also helping with uh, network organization, and it's essentially just to buttress what Martin said: is there will be uh, spatial video uh, networking opportunities. Um, but they will be limited to certain events um, that will be in the program later. Um, and I think that's probably all that can really said. I think Martin's covered a lot of that, uh, what we need to know already. Maybe I can, I can just add one more thing to that, is that indeed there, there's a lot of platforms out there and there's like every week there's a new platform. Um, and we had many discussions about the platform and in the end, there's also, again, a question of sustainability. We're not building something just for this year. We're building something that we want to take into the future for potential hybrid conferences into the future. And so I think we're really privileged to be working with Copernicus, who, who are also developers and who develop a platform and who develop tools. And uh, you know, very often we go to Martin and say, wouldn't it be cool if we could do this? And his standard re response is, oh, that's not a problem. And so um, I think it's also, it's a bit of a different philosophy, right? We're also trying to, to build our own tools and to have our own tools and to take these into the future and to take these forward rather than just only grabbing what's out there on the market and what's the cool tool this month. Yeah, yeah excellent, thank you. Um, so it appears we're quickly coming to the end of the session. So I just want to ask, one more question um and it's will uh conveners have technical support during the um during the conference yeah um, um we as most of the sessions all official sessions let's say there are a few sessions which are more like a, a character of a self-organization like uh, um, feedback meetings and so on but all scientific sessions will have a conference assistant for VPCO, this will be actually conference systems like you have uh, experienced them in the past, namely students from geoscience, ideally, who help us. Um, and we have many of them, more than 40. In Vienna, we have 120, but here, okay, of course, we need less. We have 40. And then we also have uh, a ten, um, a technical, also technical support and uh, conference uh, assistance in the Zoom meetings we organize, like union symposia, great debates, metal lectures, so um, more these uh, uh, non vpco formats. Um, so therefore, and, and we have a help desk, which is stuffed the entire time, which is also important. That is anyway important for all attendees, but of course also for people preparing their talk, preparing their session and so on. Um, so that it is relatively easy in the virtual conference center, you will experience uh, to reach somebody from the organizational team. And then if we cannot help you directly, we will find the right person to help you.
Excellent. Thanks for that. Um, so we're now out of time. I'm going to wrap up this session. Uh, I just want to quickly add that this session has been recorded and will be added to our YouTube channel. So keep an eye out for that if you want to watch it again or share it with someone who perhaps can attend. Um, and otherwise, yes, like thank you for attending. Thank you to our speakers for giving their presentations today. And hopefully I'll see you all at EGU uh, 21.